For those of you who were able to join us in the chapel this morning, uh, you know that we were led uh, during our time of uh, music and praise by Dr. Chuck Lewis and a cappella. Uh, they blessed us with their leadership. We're privileged to have them back. They're going to begin our uh, program this evening, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Chuck Lewis and a cappella. Come 
Thank you, Acapella, and thank you, Dr. Lewis. We appreciate your presence with us and for blessing us uh, this evening. We've had a marvelous day. Uh, we're so grateful to God for your presence with us and for each session. Each one has been uh, meaningful in its own way and has uh, helped us to focus on our calling, uh, beginning with the morning and running all the way through uh, the afternoon and now into this evening. So we look forward to tonight. It's a very special time. We're happy to have with us uh, Dr. Christopher Ewan, uh, who for many years taught at uh, Moody. He holds three degrees from Moody, both his uh, undergraduate degree and then a master's degree and a doctor of ministry degree. Many of you know his story. He's going to tell us uh, that story tonight. It's a very powerful story of God's redeeming work uh, in his life. And then he's going to help us think about his most recent project and perhaps its application for each one of you in your various uh, campuses, how we can uh, take uh, this project and uh, use it uh, with our students, many of whom are struggling with these issues or have friends or family members who are struggling uh, with these issues. And uh, the, the, the video project itself, I want to commend to you. I had the privilege of seeing it in its very early form and uh, writing an endorsement for it. I believe in what uh, is uh, behind this effort and the mission that is involved in it. And so we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Ewan with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming him to the IEC podium. Father, thank you for every good and perfect gift. Lord, we praise you because you are worthy of all of our praise. Lord, I thank you so much for not only Jesus, but how you have given us the bride of Christ uh, for us to come together and to worship. And um, I thank you also for Christian institutions of higher education and for schools K through 12, Lord, it's a battle. And Lord, we need a coalition to be able to come together to be able to fight against the tides that we see coming and that are here. Father, help us in every capacity that we serve to be faithful to you. For it's the matchless, beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I don't think I need to convince anyone that we live in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. Ambiguity today, even among churches, pastors, theologians, ambiguity has become a virtue. The less clear you are, the more nuanced you are the better. And this is the lie that we hear today. I, I can understand why it's in the world, but it has stepped into our institutions and even into the church. And this is the lie. That your sexual desires define you, determine you, and should always delight you. But this is something we always need to remember. The human heart has set itself in defiance against God's perfect ways. This celebration, idolatry of sexuality is on a collision course with the gospel, as my life was on a collision course with the gospel. Some of you are familiar with, with my story, and you might be wondering why did Dr. Dockery ask me to speak on this really light, non-controversial topic. Well, it's not just something that I've just studied or just written about it's something that's very real for me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values. And if you're unfamiliar with those, I can help you out. Three things. Obey your parents, do well in school, and practice piano. <laughs> I had this secret that I kept hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret. And I came out of the closet 
and I began living openly as a gay man in the gay community. So I decided to go home and break the news to my parents, and I, I told them, I am gay. They weren't Christian. But amazingly, through that crisis, God saved my mom and later my dad. Well, I went the total opposite direction, wanted nothing to do with their crazy religion. I originally, at that time, living in Chicago, and I went back down to Louisville. I was going to University of Louisville School of Dentistry. And there I kept doing what all my other friends were doing. Have fun, live it up. There's no God. And so you might as well have fun and party. And so not only was I going out to the clubs, but I started selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was received my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago to Louisville. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My father was a dentist. He knew the dean very well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit, and I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate. Besides, isn't that what any good Chinese parents would do anyway? To my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mother told the dean, it is not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And she said they're going to support whatever decision the school made. You see, my mother knew that when it comes to her children, nothing is more important than her children following Jesus. And I might ruffle some feathers here. Even more important than education. Even more important than career. But here's the sad reality in America. Many Christians may go to church on Sunday and worship God, but then they will return home and worship idols. The idol of education, the idol of career, the idol of their 401k. And in essence, often, we are forcing our kids to do the same. Our parents putting more emphasis on a daily basis on their children getting their homework done, getting a better grade, getting into a good Christian school, all good things. Or should Christian parents actually be putting more emphasis, actually the most emphasis, upon our children following Jesus? Nothing is more important than following Christ. But if I could be honest with you, I was not happy about mom's decision. She was not on my side, I felt. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago, to the bright lights in big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community. And I was not only a dealer, but I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator, because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no clue that I was doing drugs, but they knew that my biggest need was to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So they tried to reach out to the love of Christ, and I wanted nothing to do it. They came to visit me one, tonight, one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. And here's the narrative that we hear today. Christian parents cannot love their gay children. Isn't that what we hear today? They have to throw the Bible away. They have to become a so-called progressive Christian to actually love their gay child. I had the exact opposite experience. My mom and dad were not Christian and they rejected me. It wasn't until they became followers of Jesus Christ, they knew they could do nothing other than to love me as God loved them while they were powerless, while they were still sinners, while they were enemies. So I kicked them out. Before my father left, he wanted to give me something. It was his very first Bible. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. He left in my kitchen counter anyway, walked out the door. As soon as they left, I took my father's Bible. And I threw it in the trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God. And certainly nothing to do with the Bible. 
it was so obvious to my parents that I was hopeless. But my parents I've told this hundreds of times. My parents committed not to focus on hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over a hundred prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years. And once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She spent hours every morning in her prayer closet, on her knees, reading the Bible, crying out to God, interceding for me, for many, many others. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door, on my doorstep, were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large amount of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Atlantic City Detention Center. So I tried calling home, dreading making that phone call, just imagining the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But mom's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice how Paul doesn't choose to say that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath. leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not, because I hadn't called home in years, and she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears. She knew she had to do like that good old hymn says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, no matter what heartache she, she was enduring, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down. Next to the phone was a calculator. She tore off a little piece of the atom machine tape and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And when I got out of prison, this list of blessings was longer and taller than she is. Both sides. Three days later, as I was walking in the cell block, I passed by this garbage can. And I looked at this trash and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My dad has two doctorates. A paradox. I was just three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. 
with my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can. But something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book for the first time. I read through the entire gospel of Mark that night. That night. But let me tell you, I wasn't thinking There's, this is the word of God. And I certainly wasn't thinking this is the answer. I just thought that I've got an enormous time on my, time on my hand and said I better pass this somehow. But as we know, what we have in our Bibles, the very book from which we teach, we base our lives on, it is our north star in what we do in leading these institutions. It is not just ink on paper. But what we have in our Bibles is the very word of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pretty sight. And I thought things were going to get worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. I was handcuffed. The nurse sat me down. I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the word. So she wrote something on a piece of paper, slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read HIV positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, better than ten years to life. But news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed. I look up at the cold metal bunk above me. Somebody had scribbled something and it read, If you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. At the most hopeless point in my life, God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Judah, to tell me that if God could have a plan for Judah in exile, in rebellion, he could even still have a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me. But God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my idols, obviously drugs. Within a few months, he delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols. And there was just this one thing that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, my sexuality. So I went to a prison chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. I'm a brand new Christian. I know very little about the Bible. And I thought, I have to ask someone who's studied the Bible, who's gone to cemetery, seminary, the chaplain. And to my surprise, this chaplain actually told me the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And he even gave me a book explaining that view. So think about it. With much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. Can I just tell you, from a human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and his word. I couldn't even finish that book. And I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I wanted to find any shred of evidence that might bless a monogamous same-sex relationship. Any verse, I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I couldn't find any. So I was at this turning point, a crossroads. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions 
to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I am, and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally. That's obviously true, right? But then as sinners, don't we want to add to God's truth? I added, so therefore he doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who might say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. Unconditional love, it is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires, whether romantic or sexual. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy, for I am holy. You know, before I become a Christian, I was under the impression to become a Christian, I must become a heterosexual. What does that mean? I need to be sexually attracted to the opposite sex. Even as an unmarried man, I need to be sexually attracted to the opposite sex. I was even under the false, pressure, false impression that the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if a man had opposite sex attraction, he still would need to flee temptations, put to death the deeds of the body, and resist sin. So heterosexuality, it is definitely the right direction, the right pattern. It's just not the right goal. It's too broad. Because if you think about this, God doesn't command us, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual, but neither did he say, be homosexual for I am homosexual. They're actually the both, they, they are both secular Freudian categories. And instead, God says, be holy for I am. Am holy. Thus, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the right goal. It does not go far enough. Instead, the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm tempted. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling. But I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity. Change. It's not the absence of temptations. God doesn't promise you you'll never be tempted again. Jesus himself was tempted in every way, but he's without sin. Change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability. Not my ability, but the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life. And he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my call to ministry would remain the same regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle. And he shortened my prison sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left my prison sentence, I knew that if God was going to, uh, if I was going to continue on a ministry after prison, I'd better learn more about the Bible than just prison religion. So I called them, collected my parents, and I told my mom and dad, I think God's calling me in a ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute. I, I, I got, what, got into a graduate school without getting my bachelor's, so I had to go back to get my bachelor's, so I asked them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute, but then there was silence on the line, because I think they both dropped their phones. <laughs> They mailed the application into me to prison. I was really excited when I got it. Tore it open, began filling it out until I realized I needed references. And for Moody, these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison. But I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another inmate to Moody. Remember that, Tom Corman? He was actually provost at that time. 
Um, so amazingly, I was accepted. Uh, I was released from prison July of 2001, started the very next month in August. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? I graduated from Moody 2005, um, went on to my master's in exegesis actually at Wheaton, and then got my doctorate of ministry uh, at Bethel. And back in 2011, I had the wonderful privilege of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of Our Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. And this, it's alternating narrative. She wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two. She wrote all the odd chapters, I wrote the even chapters. There's a free eight-week discussion guide that's actually several Christian schools are using as a textbook. Who would have thought that our testimony is now being used as a textbook? But it makes sense. Are not our kids from pre-K on up being inundated flooded with resources they're hearing these stories i'm so happy these social media influencers uh, you'd be surprised at the top 100 social media influencers how like it's like half of them are lgbtq plus etc i'm so happy they'll say i'm so happy to finally be who i really am I've searched the pages of scripture to where it says embrace yourself. It's not there. Not embrace yourself, but deny yourself and embrace Christ. I'm pretty convinced God is not so much convinced, is not so much concerned about our happiness apart from our holiness. And then I introduced this concept of holy sexuality in, in this memoir. And I knew I needed to flesh that out. And so in two, um, this was uh, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel. It came out. It was named 2020 Book of the Year for Social Issues by Outreach Magazine. But what I saw lacking in a lot of these books was um, you had some great books on doing some good exegesis on these biblical passages, confirming um, a biblical sexuality and, and confirming that uh, same-sex relationships, same-sex sex are sinful. And then we had some books that were doing some practical theology. But I think sometimes they would try to jump that gap from exegesis to practical theology without doing good work in biblical and systematic theology. And there really wasn't, there was not a book on a theology of sexuality. I, our, our subtitle was Sex, Desire, Relationship, Shaped by God's Grand Story. That was not the original subtitle. I wanted it to be Sex, Desire, Relationship, Shaped by Biblical and Systematic Theology, but my publisher shot me down. I don't know why. Uh, they said, you want to sell your book? And I was like, I would have bought it. But uh, essentially, God's grand story from creation, redemption, um, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. But helping us to understand, to, we have to go beyond and help our kids, our college students, to understand sexuality beyond, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. We can't build a Christian life just on God's no. What is God's yes? What's the theology of sexuality? And so I go through and, 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 and help us, to, and I begin with identity, which we'll just, just talk about in just a moment. And then I go into uh, the, the concept of holy sexuality, chastity and singleness, faithfulness and marriage. That goes beyond this Freudian framework of heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, and then understanding a theology of desire and, then, and, and temptations. And then I have two chapters on a theology, a biblical theology of singleness, and two chapters on a biblical theology of marriage. And then, and then we get into the practical theology. And um, so I, I was actually, I had the blessing uh, my last few years at Moody to teach a class on a theology of sexuality. And, and so several of other seminaries and, and Bible colleges and Christian schools are using this book as kind of a framework or even required reading um, on, uh, as they're getting into, you know, some practical theology and, and uh, apologetics. So, um, but as Dr. Dockery had mentioned, um, a new project is where I've adapted this book, because this is really for adults. And boy, we need something for teens. And as I saw a few resources out there, some of them were, were older. Uh, I know Family Life has something in its audio and um, the Passport of Purity. I, 
Um, that's five lessons, but boy, we need to dig deeper. And then there's some other stuff out there that I think tend to be just really ambiguous in a lot of just stories, t- really taking a postmodern hermeneutic where it's really relying more on stories and yet still calling it Christian sexuality. And what, what are you saying? I don't think we need to give our kids more stories. See, this is really important. Things are different. If we were to be 10 years ago, 10, 20 years ago, and we were to address our church, the church today in America, or or the church 10, 20 years ago, I think maybe there's a tendency where the church in America and even our institutions uh, here needed to be more gracious. We were Sometimes truth at the expense of grace. We can't make that same mistake. We're not in the same place today. Where are kids today? They are not at all truth at the expense of grace. They are just grace at the expense of truth. So when we're coming up with these programs and our, and our response that are just so gracious... And then just blurring these lines on just clear biblical categories of, of, of sex, male and female, and of sexuality. We are just pushing our kids over the edge. I was just looking back on kind of just over the years. I've had the blessing of being able to speak for about 20 years. I've counted, I think it's about 60 to 75, 60 to 65 Uh, Christian schools, Christian colleges and universities that I've spoken at. And I've seen a big shift. I mean, there was a time when it was almost, I would be speaking a dozen Christian schools every single school year. Now, two or three. What happened 10, 12 years ago was this. I would come and I'll be protesting. The students would protest, and, and they were usually respectful. It wasn't really disruptive, but they, were, they would protest with all their gear. And Then something changed about seven, eight years ago. There was still a protest, but it wasn't organized by the students. It was organized by faculty. I have a really big privilege to address many of presidents and leaders at Christian institutions. God has given you a responsibility to be faithful. History repeats itself. Princeton, Harvard, Yale, and it's happening all over again. And I believe the one thing that we miss, and, and I wasn't planning plan to say this before, but I've said this many times. I believe often it begins in student development. If you don't have a good solid whole of res life and student development, and there's not clarity. I'm talking about crystal clarity. I'm not talking about mainline denominations where, where gay marriage is okay. We're having people today, right now, speaking at the vast majority of Christian schools today that they say they hold to a traditional sexual ethic. ethic. And I'll, I'm going to address this later. I'm getting ahead of myself. But they don't. Gay is okay. What I believe that we have to get right with IACE, with your institutions, when we are holding for policy, it's not simply, um, you know, that this is sinful behavior. We have to hold on to religious rights. When it comes to sexuality and gender, I believe, if I can just very humbly give you my humble opinion, we have to be sure we do not fall into the lie of the world that sexuality is who you are. When we're talking about equality for the problem with that 
is that it already concedes the fact that sexuality is an aspect of personhood. I mean, we're living post Obergefell and Bostock. And what that has done, it has made sexuality and now gender a protected class. A protected class of what? Personhood. See, if we don't get this right, if, if, when all our faculties and, and, and those in, in, in people of position, I mean, I, I think to be in the position that you are, you can't be a nice guy. You have to be bold enough to say, I love you, but this is not a good fit. And I got to let you go. We have this drift, as Dr. Moeller so says. We all, I mean, it's just not the human heart. We have this drift, but institutions, we will drift. So we have to get this right. Who am I? That has enormous ramifications. How, we all, our students, answer this question in many ways. Our faculty answer this in many ways. Some, some, their identity is shaped by family, friends, or their surroundings. Others put their identity in their work. I'm a lawyer, or sports, I'm a football player, or a hobby, I'm a gamer. Still others put their sole identity in their sexuality. I am gay or their self-perception. I am trans. But do these substitutes actually describe who we are or something else? And I know oftentimes, I mean, I, 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 I sometimes, you know, am I coming down too hard? People sometimes question me. You know, you know people like you and others, like Rosaria Butterfield, we're just... We're just quibbling over words. We're making mountains out of molehills. Can't we just all get along? You say tomato, I say tomato. Someone might say I am gay, and, and I don't say that. But don't you mean the same thing? No, words matter. The Bible is written with words. Theology is with words. Words matter. How we all answer this question, who am I? It affects it affects what we think, it affects the choices we make, it affects the relationships that we build. Our thoughts, our choices, our relationships are shaped in large part by how we all answer this question, who am I? Which suggests this close relationship between essence and ethics. Who we are, essence, impacts how we live, ethics. And vice versa is true. How we live, ethics, impacts who we are. This is where we see this very close interplay between ontology and ethics. So if you have a flawed view of who you are, you're going to have a flawed, flawed personal ethic. And vice versa, if you have a flawed personal ethic, you're going to have a flawed view of who you are. So if a kid says, I'm a partier, is that going to impact how he lives? Yes. What if a person says, I'm a lawyer, is that going to influence what she thinks about? She's going to think a lot about law. Or, I'm a football player. Is that, going to, is that going to impact the choices he makes? He's going to choose on his free time to play football, watch football, practice football. Or, what if a person says, I'm a gamer? Is that going to influence the, the relationship she builds? Most of her friends will be gamer. See, our thoughts, our choices, our relationships, our actions, our lives are shaped in large part by how, how we all answer this question, who am I? Personhood affects practice. Practice affects personhood. Before my conversion, when I identified as a gay man, my whole world was gay. That affected my thoughts, my choices, my relationships. As a matter of fact, all my friends were gay men. There's this misperception that there's such a thing as an LGBTQ plus community. There's not. There's communities. They're not one monolithic group. Gay men. I lived in an apartment complex in Midtown Atlanta that was 90 to 95% gay men. I worked out at a gay gym. I bought my groceries at what we nicknamed the Gay Kroger. I bought my new sports car at a gay car dealer car dealership, my bookkeeper was gay, my housekeeper was gay, everything and everyone around me was affirming what my flesh was saying, I am gay. You see, this has to come before trying to talk to someone that this is sinful behavior. How could, this has to come before talking to someone who identifies as gay that this is sinful behavior. 
Because how can they even understand this as sinful behavior when they don't even view it as behavior? They view it as who they are. See, if we were to go back in time and I was to meet you and you were to tell me this is sin, I wouldn't hear you say what I'm doing is sin or my desires are sinful. No, I would hear you say that my whole person from head to toe is reprehensible to you and to God. See, before I knew Christ, I couldn't hate my sin without hating myself. Now that I know Christ, I can hate my sin without hating myself. That's the difference. This, it, even um, Christian leaders today that are normalizing this term gay, they very naively, and often it's coming from people who've, who've never been in my shoes or, you know, others. What, what, I've been in Babylon. I don't want to go back to Babylon. I'm going to warn people of Babylon. Don't even go close to Babylon. We're not going to borrow from Babylon. We're not going to steal from Babylon. Don't, I'm, let's not pitch our tent right on the border of Babylon. I'm not in exile of Babylon. I mean, if you are, you're being punished and you need to repent. Don't go close. And yet we're kind of just blurring the lines. I learned so, so many things um, when I was in Bible college and seminary, but I'll never forget one of my homiletics professors said, and I know you guys know this, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pews. There's a mist in the pulpit. There's a mist in, the, in our theological departments. There's a mist in our apologetics uh, uh, there there's a mist going on today and we need clarity being gay i mean so why how the term gay when we kind of minimize and trivialize and say just it only means attractions that completely misunderstands what the world means by it yes it does mean that naively that's that people will think that's all it means, that is not all it means. As someone who identified as gay for years, it does not simply mean attractions. It means who I am. Let, let, let me prove this to you. The term gay, what, what is the verb that we put before gay? Doing gay? Feeling gay? That would be more accurate. What, what do we say today? Being. Gay. What does being mean? Who we are. When we make that error, being gay, it reveals this deep philosophical and theological misunderstanding. It's a faulty presupposition. It's a wrong starting point that points to our essence, to the core of our being. Being gay no longer means what I'm attracted to or what I desire or what I do. It has wrongly become who I am. In this conversation, This subtle shift from what to who, meaning what I feel, what I do, to who I am, has created this radically distorted view of personhood. And yet, I don't know of any other experience, any other desire or thought or perception that we've made it who we are. Let's say if a person were to say, I am happy, who do we ever think that's who you are? No. Unless they're a dwarf and hang out with six other dwarfs in Snow White. If a person says, I am happy, we would all think, well, that's great. That's what you feel now. Let's go to the other side of the spectrum. Not I am happy, but I am depressed. Some of you might have loved ones who wrestle with depression. Christians. Someone were to confide with you, I am depressed. Should we ever tell them that is who you are? You You need to embrace it. And yet, let's follow the logic of the world. Oftentimes, people who identify as gay, they will say, I didn't choose this. Do people choose their depression? No. So it's who they are. Or, people raised in the church, and then they leave their faith and identify as LGB, etc. They will say, I prayed and prayed for God to take it away. Anyone know people like that? I prayed for God to take it away. But he didn't. So God made me this way. People with Christians with depression. I know several. 
They prayed and prayed for God to take it away. Now, can he? Absolutely. Does he always? No. So when he doesn't, that means God made them that way. See how that logic is bad? See, regardless of whether you didn't choose something or not, regardless of whether someone doesn't answer your prayer or not, regardless of whether you've had it for as long as you remember, it is not who you are. We, it, we, there's no other. And how about take a behavior, a sinful behavior? If a person gossip, gossips all the time, you're a gossiper. Is that who a person is? No. An adulteress, is that who she is? No. And yet when it comes to gay, being gay, we've completely made it who a person is. So if sexuality is not who we are, then what is it? Sexuality is not who we are, but how we feel. And when we make the error to make it who we are, might this be a categorical fallacy that will then ultimately distort how we think, the choices we make, the relationships that we build, our actions, and our whole lives. You see, the term heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, it turns desire into personhood, experience into essence. Actually, gay, straight, bi, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual shouldn't be used to describe people. Getting back to my point before. These don't describe people. They describe our desires, our behaviors, our experience. But where are we today? No longer are we sola scriptura, scripture alone. Today, we are sola experientia, experience alone. So who am I, who are you, who are we? And how do we understand this question? And how do we do that first to better understand human sexuality because actually we can't properly understand human sexuality until we first understand humans through God's eyes, theological anthropology. And, and I'm just going to focus on two important aspects that will help us understand human sexuality. We're created in the image of God, but we're also all fallen. And specifically four things. Theological anthropology helps us to rebuke the arrogant condemner. You might have that relative or that friend, person in your church. Those gay people, they're ruining our country. No, sin is ruining our country. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. The gay community, they're not our enemies. They, may think, they might think we are their enemies. But even if they were, what does Jesus say? Love thy enemies. So interesting. Love. Are we not, confu are we not just accused of having a narrow understanding of love that's absolutely not true the world can't even fathom love outside of marriage you restrict marriage we can't love love is love the world is the most narrow in their understanding of love marriage does not have a monopoly on love not only do we know that Love occurs outside of marriage. We're even called to love our enemies. No one else does that. We want to talk about the most broad, liberal, if you will, understanding of love, Christian love. You see, regardless of anyone's age, sex, or ethnicity, not race, because they're, the whole concept of race is racist. The whole concept, who came up with the white race, the black race, the father of racism? The, the, you want to get rid of institutional racism, Darwin. There's not different races, they're one human race. We're all created in God's image. Regardless of anyone's age, sex, or ethnicity, regardless of whether someone is submission to God or not, regardless of whether someone identifies wrongly as LGB, etc., whatever letters. They're created in the image of God, and they have value and dignity. Every person has value and should be treated with respect. Actually, the imago Dei is the only true foundation for justice. Second, beginning with theological anthropology, we're creating God's image, but we're also all fallen. It actually avoids a common incorrect diagnosis. You might have heard it before. Something like this, that the root causes of homosexuality are an absentee father, dominant mother, or abuse in one's childhood. 
Now, those definitely are negative influences. I don't argue with that. But an influence is not a cause. Because we need to look at Scripture. Scripture calls this sinful behavior. What's the root cause of just sin in general? Whatever sin you might be struggling with. Pride. Jealousy. Lust. What's the root cause of that? Your mom. Doesn't that sound like Genesis 3? It's the woman you gave me. We keep trying to shift the blame when the blame is here. My sinful, broken, fallen nature. You see, where does that idea come from? That your problems as an adult is rooted in your childhood. Where does that come from? Sigmund Freud. And why is it that we sometimes are more busy trying to chase after Freud than chasing after Jesus Christ? Because when we make an influence, the root cause, that's going to veer it away from the correct diagnosis. Because if you have an incorrect diagnosis, you're going to treat it incorrectly. Because if sin is a developmental problem, instead of sending Jesus Christ, God would have just sent us a support group. And I think those can be helpful, but it's not the answer for sin. You see, we're creating God's image, but we're also all fallen. Sin is the root cause. Our sin, original sin, indwelling sin, that's the root cause. And therefore, Jesus Christ is the answer. Not Jesus plus, not Jesus sort of, not Jesus maybe. And if you want a support group, God gave us one, the local church. Can I encourage you, leaders, presidents? You probably say this, but we have to make sure it pushes down to Res Life and the RAs. Our institutions are not the bride of Christ. I know too many students that go to our schools. They love the school. They're very active in school. Even good students, they're not even a member of a local church. That is a failure. If our kids are not tied to the bride, how can we say we love Christ if we don't even love the bride of Christ? But you see, this, this framework of this incorrect diagnosis has had some negative impact, especially on parents. Maybe some of you might have some friends who have wayward children. And they raised them fearing the Lord, raised them in the church they, they did Bible studies with their families, family devotions, and their kids walked away. And they probably keep themselves up at night. What did I do wrong? Please tell them I said this. It's not your fault. Perfect parenting does not guarantee perfect children. Look at Adam and Eve. They perfect, had a perfect father. They had a perfect environment. They still rebelled. The job of a Christian parent actually is not to produce godly children. I say it's not their job because they can't do that. If they could, they'd be God. The job of a Christian parent is just to be a godly parent. You pray your heart out that your children would follow Jesus, but then let God be God. Third, and so just as this is, you know, I, I'm trying to help my friends that are, you know, kind of in the, the old paradigm of using developmental theory, to, they're close, but use the biblical framework, theological anthropology. But here's the one that's probably the more insidious one that is just wreaking havoc in our churches and in our institutions. It's the side B gay Christian, so-called gay Christian revoice movement. And it is not simply over disagreeing over terminology. The core is repentance. Because the issue is, is sexual immorality only the act? That's the issue. Because is it just don't act? Just be celibate. But all the everything, everything else, you could be in a relationship. You can actually be in this, this, this 
basically a gay marriage without the sex, where they make a union together, they live together, they have a house together, two same-sex attracted men, just as long as they don't have sex. And they, they don't call it a gay marriage. Instead, they call it a spiritual friendship. Isn't that how Satan works? By just nuance, changing the terminology, changing the definitions. We're using some of the same words. They're just making a new dictionary. I used to think that. I'm going to be very honest here. I used to think that. As long as I don't act. Okay, I've got some of my, my struggles. I'm tempted. As long as I don't act. Until I read scripture. And Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, if a man looks lustfully at a woman, he's fine as long as he doesn't act on it. Is that what Jesus says? Or does he say, if a man looks lustfully at a woman, and those of you know, it's epithumia, same word for desire. If a man desires another woman, he has already, what, committed adultery. So is it just don't act? Or is it that desire we must repent of? Now, external temptations, not sin. The internal temptations that James talks about that come from our sinful heart, that's a different story, but we have to lead people to repentance. Because this is the same again going back to Genesis 3. Did God actually say? We have to point people to Christ and freedom. Do not, do not identify by your sin. Do not encourage your students or your faculty, your staff to identify. Don't identify as a gossiping Christian. Don't identify as a lustful Christian or as a porn-watching Christian. Or don't identify as any of that. I don't identify as a gay Christian. If I would, I'd be trying to resuscitate my dead man every time I did. Identify with Jesus Christ alone. Don't identify with death. Fourth, beginning with theological anthropology, it helps us to answer the born gay question. Man, our kids are just, they're just so much information. Not only just from social media, but their peers, from their youth pastors, from churches, from Christian leaders and apologists and and. And authors is, you know, God made, I've even heard people say, you know, who, who say they're gay and celibate and, and they're going to be gay in eternity. Did God make a person gay? Are people born gay? And people are like, well, the Bible doesn't address this. Actually, Jesus does. That even though people wrongly think they're born gay, Jesus says, you must be born again. You may think you're born an alcoholic. You must be born again. You may think you're born a liar, a cheater. You must be born again. You may think you're born a you fill in the blank. You must be born again. The old is gone, the new is come in Christ. You're a new creation. That is not a message just for the gay community. That is a message for the whole world. You must be born again. You know, I know some of you don't hear a lot of stories like mine. A guy who used to identify as gay and now no longer do. And that's an important aspect of my story. But that's not how I best summarize it. This is how I summarize it. I once was blind. And now I see. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once did not believe, and now I believe in the Son of God, and his name is Jesus. That's my testimony. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord, nothing, nothing inside of me could have ever saved myself. I was not seeking but, Lord, in your loving kindness, your arm was not too short to save. You reached down. Save me from my sin. 
Lord, I pray for every institution represented here, every organization, Lord God. Lord, it is our nature to turn. But I pray in your loving kindness, O oh God, that as we see even inst other institutions kind of just playing with fire and walking on the blurring the lines, Lord, I just pray that in humility would we go forward. Lord, help us to guide our team, our councils, our staff, our faculty. Lord, we are not going to waver. Lord, we are going to stick to the North Star who is Christ. God, we love you, but help us to love you more than life. For it's in the matchless, precious, powerful name of Jesus that we pray. And the people of God said, amen. And while you come up, can we show, I just wanted to show you the, the video, of like a video series promo so we can have a little bit of idea for it. Few things more relevant and controversial than sexuality and gender. How do we as Christians respond full of grace and full of truth? Charles Spurgeon said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and and almost right. My name is Christopher Yuan, and I have created a 12 lesson video curriculum designed just for you, the parent, to watch at home with your teenager. I will share my own testimony of having identified as a gay man and now no longer do. I will also tell some anecdotes and stories, but the bulk of these 250 minutes of teaching will be grounded in the Word of God. If you would like more information, go to holysexuality.com. So um, this was actually, we were in talks with different organizations to partner to produce this, um, but uh, the Lord kind of drew us away from that, and we kind of did this on our own. So there's like no marketing team, there's no publicity. We're like trying to figure it out. This was actually a huge project. Uh, we had quotes to do this and produce this, and it was 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 million dollars. We actually, fortunately, were able to do it much less than that, about half. Uh, but my parents um, put all into this, and we had a few other donors that helped. Uh, it should cost $300 per license. It's a two-year license. It's 12 lessons, 30, uh, tw um, um, 12 lessons, 36 videos, 270 minutes of content. Um, but our donors are basically giving it away for 20. So we want every family to do this. So it's, we want to actually take this out of the, the classroom and into the family room and into the living room, into the dining room, because that's the key, family discipleship. Um, so that we're super excited about this. Um, but we, uh, you can see the animation. Uh, it's, animation is super expensive. I, you guys are probably familiar with that. They charge by second, actually 24 frames per second. Uh, we have 90 minutes of animation. And many of these animators did stuff for the Bible Project. Uh, so really, really high custom animation and sound. So please help us get the, uh, w get the word out. Yes. Thanks so much for what you shared. I wanted to ask a question about your, uh, your slide on sexuality as feeling. Because I've run across some Christian teaching and, and writing that uses the term sexuality seemingly to more refer to the theological anthropology of gender. Yes. And so is there, speaking again to the distinction of terms and that importance, do you try to m make sure that there's a big distinction on exactly what you mean I by do. sexuality? Yes, I, I, and I think that's really important. So um, sexuality, um, now of course the two, uh, male and female and sexuality, they are definitely related but we have to see the distinguish where they're not the same because one is an existential reality, the other one is an ontological reality. Where sexual and the desires, that's an existential reality, our experiences. Whereas sex, that's an ontological reality. 
we have to really clearly, as theologians and philo uh, uh, philosophers and educators, help our kids. I actually, um, I, I have a talk, actually, um, an article, that my, my kind of lecture, um, I turned into an article, uh, Desiring God, if you can see that there's, um, he made the male and female sex desire, uh, sex, gender, and the image of God. Um, but, and I can't remember if I said it there in, the, in that article, because you know, I have to take so much stuff out. But I sort of argue that instead of us saying that we're sexual beings, because sexual, in our hypersexualized world, what does that, we conflate the two, and when we think sexual, we think, I have to have sex. That's what the world says. Freud says that, Kinsey says that, politics, Barbara Lee says that. And our kids think that. We think sexual as, as the act, the experience. I actually rather say that we're sexed beings, X-E-X-E-D. That's an ontological reality. Um, that's so closely actually linked to the Im Imago Dei, Genesis 127. There's all, I mean, for the past millennia, we've been talking about, or even several millennia, uh, including Jewish tradition, about what is the image of God. And yet, right in Genesis 127, in this tricolone of the parallel lines of poetry, we have sex, male and female, that's closely linked to being created in the image of God. And I think an important thing that we need to remember is that sex is not only biological. Don't make that, don't make that mistake. Sex is not only biological. It's a spiritual, eternal, ontological reality. So we can't change that. So yes, sexuality... Um, is referring to, you know, the existential experience that we have. And, but our sex as male or female, and, and I'm even now careful in the, circ the circles that I'm in, gender has been redefined, unfortunately. Um, and, and obviously, you know, we don't have to agree with it, and, but we have to recognize, you know, as we are... If we're going to go into another culture, another country, we got to learn their language. There's a new language today. Actually, even in the 20 years that I've come to faith, we're used, it's a whole new vocabulary that I've had to keep up with. And, it, and five years from now, it's going to be a whole, a whole other dictionary. So um, gender now is this more, uh, it's a self-perception of what I feel or I think of myself. It's, su it's subjective, whereas sex is objective. So yes, I do think it's important to help people as we're discussing these things because there's all this conflation. I, I am, I'm just very simple in my thinking, I think. I, I have to have categories because when I don't and we're confusing everything, that's when this whole discussion gets all cloudy and the blinds are blurred. For example, desire, temptation. The word attraction is this sin. I mean, I, I, the word attraction is not even in scripture temptation and desire. So let's talk about those things. But yes, sexuality, I think we need to be careful not to then conflate it to the ontological reality of male and female, of sex. Thanks. That's very helpful. Yep. Thank you so much, Christopher. Oh, Jennifer welcome. Patterson with RTS you, Washington. Yes. Um, I, the, the ontological distinctions you're making are really helpful. And I'm wondering about what you see with uh, gender redefinition and the wider ramifications of ontological questioning beyond this set of issues, but just questioning ontological reality generally. You've thought so much about this. I wonder if we could benefit from your thinking about that further. And as we're teaching about this issue, how can we be backstopping against the spread of that questioning into other, in reality generally? Does that with, make sense? With our students and, yeah. or in policy and I mean every, everything, right? Yeah, or everything, <laughs> everything, right? But beginning with students maybe or whichever you want to comment on. Yeah, I, I think it's really, really important because um, I mean it's just history repeats itself. So it's, it's neo-Gnosticism really. I mean it's dualism and it, it, that really has never gone away. And we have to help our kids understand, because it is easy, you know, just, we're just, you know, um, we just hyper-spiritualize everything, and, and that's just the tendency. I think that's just our sin nature to just want to separate. Our, I think that the enemy wants us to do that, to separate 
you know, the mind, soul from the body. And, um, and so the body doesn't matter. And, and that's just been going on since, you know, the beginning of the church and, and even probably even, and, and even before that. So I, I think having a healthy understanding of a, of, a, of a proper Protestant theology of the body is important. Um, you know, I, I was kind of jumping into uh, more doing a theology of sexuality. And, um, but others have done that well. I think Nancy Piercy's done, done that well. But um, we, we have to help that. So actually, in, in my book, I didn't, um, I didn't really address that as, as much. That, because I wrote that in 2017, and gender and transgenderism was also a big thing. But in my video series, I definitely put that in. Mm -hmm. And I, not only did I put that in about sex, gender, and the image of God, but I also put in what's the big deal. Why, why is sex uh, such a big deal? And it's a big deal because our bodies matter. And I go right to 1 Corinthians 6 about, you know, our body is um, a, a temple of the Holy Spirit, etc. And so it's why our bodies matter to God. Um, so, yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. And, and also in the, um, in the video series, I, I just wanted to really rely on and lean in just... The history of the church and on our traditions how we uh, use we would catechize our kids um, I've sometimes we've just lost that uh, the good old question and answer question and answer so actually I have 12 lessons every lesson has a question and answer a couple questions a couple answers um, to provide our kids that actually the first one um, and, and and some of the the, the the resources that we have kind of end up being about human effort, isn't it? You know, just don't. And you can almost apply it to any person that doesn't know Christ. I didn't want to make that mistake. So actually, like, lesson one, it was my testimony, but the, the, the question, the main question was, what is the ultimate goal when it comes to sexuality? The ultimate goal when it comes to sexuality is to glorify God by denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. Actually, I end every lesson with telling the kids, now go and follow Jesus. I didn't want them to miss that. Did anyone else? Thank you so very much for uh, this evening session. We look forward to tomorrow. We have three sessions remaining. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Greg Baylor's uh, presentation in the morning at 8.30. Uh, some of you come every year just to hear Greg Baylor. Uh, he's the uh, reason that uh, we uh, gather many, for many of you. So we get a legal update and we look forward to hearing from you, then we have two very uh, important uh, panel discussions to follow. So we look forward to a, to a good day. Uh, there is a shuttle service or a van service available going back to the uh, Hyatt uh, TCU tonight. So if you want to take that, feel free to do so. If you take it back, let them know if you want the service in the morning. They'll pick you up at the Hyatt at 7 o'clock to bring you here for breakfast at 7.15. So let them know so they can come and do that. There is the possibility of two shuttle services tomorrow to the airport. A one at 8.30 for those that have early flights and a second one at noon. So as soon as we finish <clears throat> tomorrow at noon, there'll be a, a van service available to take you uh, to DFW. We don't take to Love Field. If you're going to Love Field, you're on your own. But uh, to DFW, we can uh, get you there. So, but we need to know that tonight. And particularly if anybody is going to need the 8.30 uh, service tomorrow, which will mean you'll miss Greg. But if you need that, 
to, for an early flight, we need to know tonight. So make sure you let me know before you leave or somebody who's out there at the table. So thank you for a wonderful day, and we look forward to a good day tomorrow. God's blessings upon you. Get some rest, and we'll see you tomorrow.